Hello all. Taking a break from our nuclear fusion odyssey this week, I have a very special episode for you today. This week, our guest is Dr. Kate Devlin. She's a senior lecturer in computer science who studies artificial intelligence and human-robot interaction, and she wrote a magnificent book called Turned On, Science, Sex and Robots. Now, the tagline is that the book is about love and sex with robots, and there's a great deal of fascinating stuff in there about that, but it's also a wonderful history of humanoid robotics in reality and in fiction, and a great survey of the academic research into human-robot interactions in general. As AI and chatbots become more omnipresent and also take on a bigger role in our culture, whole new fields of psychology and sociology are opening up around them. We've already talked a little bit about chatbots in past episodes, and Dr. Devlin's book was one of the best and most entertaining works that I've read about artificial intelligence and robots in a long time, so I was super excited that she agreed to be interviewed. Without further ado then, the interview. First of all, thanks very much, Dr. Devlin, for coming on the show. Well, thank you for having me. I'd like to ask you about your background and career first before we get to discussing Turned On. So you started in the field of archaeology and then made the switch to computer science, except at first it was sort of a switch that was combining the two. So how did you find archaeology? What inspired the change? And how did you find uh, switching between academic fields? I'd always wanted to be an archaeologist, and so I did. I became one. Um, But it wasn't very long working before I realised that it's a very difficult career to have in that most of the work as a field archaeologist is contract work. So I wanted to be able to specialise in a way that would sort of guarantee employment and make myself more employable. And computing seemed to be the thing to do because I could merge the two and I find that really interesting. And then when I actually started doing computer science, so I did a, did a master's conversion course and then went on to do a PhD in it, I found out more and more that I really enjoyed looking at the interaction between humans and technology. And that's really what inspired me to get to kind of keep going with that. And so I did initially do a lot of cultural heritage projects where I was combining the two, but more and more I was getting interested in cognition and perception. And I sort of wound up doing HCI and AI out of that. Mm-hmm. And as I understand it, a lot of the stuff you were doing, particularly in your master's and so on, was this idea of almost virtual archaeology sites. Is that right? And it seems to me like that's the kind of thing that might be coming back into fashion now that we have more affordable VR headsets and things along these lines. Yeah, so I I was involved in looking at representations of past environments and how can we make them seem perceptually relevant. So a a lot of the representations that we make of the past tend to be something that's you know maybe a helicopter fly over things like that you know things that would never have been happening at the time sites are created completely anachronistic yeah and so I wanted to say how can we do this so it looks as if we are back in a time when those sites were being used or those objects were being created Um, and that's a really difficult thing to do obviously because it's very subjective Um, but there's a lot to do with the lighting so it was about simulating physical lighting and scenes to see how perception changed and it, it, was, it has quite a profound change on how people perceive environments. If you think about the light we have today, it's very static, electric white light. But in the past, of course, it was flickering dynamic light and it was limited in, in time of day. It was limited in the buildings that were being used. So it completely changes our perception of an environment. So I find that really, really interesting to look at what we saw back then. <laughs> and I think at some point along the way, this has then morphed into your current field of expertise, which is this idea of human computer interaction. It it comes onto artificial intelligence, but it also deals with things like human cognition and human emotions and human behavior and how we relate to robots and even non-human entities, I guess you could say. It's a really fascinating area. And I think what comes across very strongly in Turned On, which is your book everyone should read, which is almost a history of how humans have related to computers with a particular aspect of human relationships, I guess, first and foremost in mind. And it really feels like we're starting to move into a world where people can have these interactions in a more meaningful way than just you know, commanding their digital devices to do X, Y, or Z. So was there a sort of Hollywood-style eureka moment where you first became fascinated by this uh, interaction between humans and machines? Not really. It was always there in terms of how people react to technology. So from the archaeology, I was really interested in how we change, how society changes or reacts every time there is some kind of technological shift. Um, so archaeology is the study of material culture and you know our technology is that material culture and we see fear of technology and fear of change coming in very early on you know there's 
recordings of um, you know, Plato writing that um, Socrates didn't want writing, write things down because it would ruin our memory. And it's the same kind of argument you have over smartphones today. You know, if you, you use a smartphone, you're dependent on it, your memory goes. And of course, long term, that's that's not necessarily true. We adapt. So yes, we have um, less ability to remember certain things like phone numbers now, but you know, we've freed up our minds to do other things. There's other things coming in to fill those gaps. So I was interested in how people change, not just society, but people as well, how we adapt to things. And I think this attachment to technology is really interesting because we approach it as social creatures. There's been lots of work in this field to show that our relationship with technology is driven by our own social engagement. So I, I wanted to see just how far that went and you know, what what is involved in creating an attachment to a piece of technology. But also, I think one of the things that came out was um, at a conference, an EU COG conference for cognitive systems, we were thinking, well, you know what, how can a machine think like us and could we imbue it with things that make us human? And one of those things is, is sex and love and desire and arousal. So how could a machine ever feel that? So I was intrigued from both angles, really. Mm -hmm. And it is it is definitely a fascinating question because I think one of the things that learning about robots and AI and thinking about these things, it, it forces humans to undergo a process of self-reflection. Because if you're asking the question, can a robot be conscious uh, or indeed can an animal be conscious or anything like that, you almost have to define, well, what is our own consciousness? What is our own? Uh, how do we define our own cognition, our own ability to think, our own feelings? And what would you need to replicate to decide that, yes, this robot is human in X, Y, or Z respect? Yeah, this is the really hard thing. So the whole big question of what is consciousness anyway, and no one has an answer to that. Um, you know, it's the stuff of philosophical debate for centuries. So we don't know. I mean, I know, I know or, or I presume that we are all conscious, but, you know, what is that? Where does that come from? We don't know. Um, does it matter in terms of machines? I thought that was really intriguing. So if a machine... If a robot or an AI shows signs of human-like ability, um, even if we know it's not got that real ability, is that enough for us to treat it as if it's conscious? So I think there's lots of things around there, and it's one of those sort of rabbit holes you go down, because I remember doing my PhD, you get to that second year of your PhD where you just start questioning the existence of everything. So you know, I was there going, how do we make things look real? What is reality anyway? And suddenly you find yourself in this... this massive way of exploring how we think about the world so you know I was very con conscious ho ho um that I couldn't really go down that route so you know it's, it's trying to explore how we react to something that seems consciousness without actually defining what that consciousness is mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it, it's very interesting too just to think about the uh public perception of AI um, to pick out some case studies, one of the points in Turned On that I found myself sort of vehemently agreeing with you was in the description of Sophia. Yeah, Sophia is a, a human-like robot made by Hanson Robotics. And she, and I'm going to gender her deliberately here, um, so she's made to look like a woman. She was apparently based on Audrey Hepburn, though it's quite hard to see the resemblance, really. But she is um, this, yeah, very clearly a robot, but with a lot of human-like expressions and speech that is partly scripted, apparently partly AI. Um, I think quite a lot of it is very heavily scripted. Um, so she's made to look like a, a human robot, really. Um, and there's a lot of controversy in the AI ethics community about whether or not that's a good thing. And a lot of people think that Sophia is, is granted or imbued with... Um, kind of abilities beyond what she is actually capable of. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit of a puppet, a little bit of deceit going on there. Mm -hmm. And we've had things like Sophia, I mean, famously and very controversially, she was given Saudi citizenship in some sort of possibly legal, possibly not legal publicity stunt, really. And yeah. <laughs> uh, regularly making media appearances proclaimed as the first artificial intelligence or the first humanoid robot or similar. So while we're talking about the appearance of Sophia, as, as you mentioned she she does have this this realistic they call it f flesh rubber or frubber uh coating on the outside um but also the back of the head is kind of left open to yes. allow people so to see that they see. are a robot so what what what's your feeling about the sort of uncanny valley and is is this theory that uh things that are almost but not quite human 
is this discredited or is this still a realistic problem and how does Sophia sort of fit into that spectrum? It's still a realistic problem, but we don't know if it's constant, if it will hold. So there's the uncanny valley, the idea that the closer we get to something looking human, when it's not human, the more freaked out we are until that gap closes and it's indistinguishable from being a human. And that definitely still exists, but we've noticed that um, definitely it's not universal, that there are possibly cultural differences in how people respond and also possibly generational differences in how people respond. And in some cases, people are more accepting. So CGI used to have this problem um, with special effects, but now we are much more tolerant of it. Um, and they're getting better at it. And so that gap is closing in terms of computer graphics. But in robotics, there's so many components that make up human-like um, attributes so you've not just got the appearance but you've got voice and movement and ability coming in there as well so I think it still is a problem and we still tend to get a little bit freaked out by the human not human parts. So we've talked about Sophia being built to flatter to deceive and how they don't necessarily always make it clear that the conversations are scripted or unscripted mm -hmm. and I think it makes Sophia a fascinating case study for the perception of humanoid robots and AI in the public eye, even if Sophia isn't the sort of tip-top example of what can actually be achieved with humanoid robots today. I mean, when you look at how people respond to this robot in everything from the celebrities who interview the robot to people in YouTube comments and so on, worrying about the end of the world and so on, what do you think we can learn about how humans will interact with robots in the future just from this sort of specific case study? Um, I think that there are... Definitely, there's an excitement around it, but also a wariness. Uh, people are quite fearful of of robotics in general when it comes to this kind of thing because there there is a sense of worry around a loss of agency. I think that's very clear in all forms of robotics. We have a fear of automation. In terms of the sex robots, we have a fear of being replaced. You know that that the, the ultimate thing that you know you're going to lose someone you love to a robot. Um, so I think there is an excitement around. The novelty around it but there's also definitely wariness and a bit of skepticism i think as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is it the case do you think maybe that we're that we're too quick to anthropomorphize robots and assign human qualities like intelligence and emotion to them or are we underestimating what they can be by viewing them as just objects I think we do anthropomorphize quite quickly but i don't necessarily think it's a bad thing because it helps us interact um, and I think that we're seeing the emergence of a new social category where we know things are robots or AI. We know that they are technological. And I think quite often people are aware of the limitations, but at the same time, we're prepared to suspend that knowledge and interact anyway as if they were real. So I think we've got really interesting stuff going on in terms of interaction at the moment. We almost... We have a mode of behaviour where we're interacting with each other, of course, as, as fellow humans, and then maybe another mode where we're interacting with children and we might change you know, things like our diction, we might change our tone of voice, the mm. types of topics that we discuss. So we have these different modes of interaction based on a kind of intellectual hierarchy, maybe. And people trying to fit robots into this, people... There's lots of interesting anecdotes in your book about people, for example, saying please and thank you to Alexa yeah. and Siri and things along those lines. I mean, do you think that there is genuinely this new sort of category emerging where people are interacting with chatbots and interacting with technology? Definitely, yes, I do think that. Um, and, it, and it's an interesting one. I mean, certainly for things like voice assistants, AI voice assistants, we have to reshape the way we speak in order to use them. So we know that there are problems at the moment with people's accents or people's diction. You know, like my father, for example, has had two strokes and cannot speak particularly clearly. And so he has occasionally got trouble using Alexa. He has to form up the commands in a very brief, specific way. He's also got a Northern Ireland accent, which compounds the problem because the, the AI doesn't deal well with regional accents. So we have this change as well with the syntax where we have to start each sentence with the name of the voice assistant. So Siri or Alexa or hey Google. Um, so we change immediately changing the sentence structure. And then a lot of people will use natural language to talk to the voice assistants when you don't really need to. You could just say, 
Alexa weather in London and you'd get the same results. But people like to say, hey, Alexa, or Alexa, what is the weather in London? Um, and I think that's really interesting. And it's telling that people are polite as well and that they do say please and thank you because there's a social conditioning to do that. And we can, you know, that's okay. There, there is worry that, you know, if people get into saying please and thank you, then they're putting too much emphasis on the personalized nature of these things. There's other worries that if we don't say please and thank you, it will spill into real life and rudeness. Uh, so it's, it's hard to know at this stage what the right answer is, but I would say that we can certainly encourage people to, to be polite, um, but at the same time, we don't really need to because it's just a machine. So it's, it's kind of unpicking all this interesting stuff about these interactions that I find so intriguing. Yeah, I, d I did find it very interesting that people were worried that now that we have Alexas and Series and so on, that we can bark orders at, that it might spill over into how we treat, you know, I don't know, waiters and waitresses and people in the service industry and so on. And, you know, obviously, I hope that that wouldn't happen. But you can almost see how people might start to put these categories together. And it, it, it's a little bit worrying, especially if you live in a slightly futuristic society where some of these jobs are done by robots and some of them are still done by humans, if you see what I mean. That's kind of it. We don't have the evidence um, to say what's going to happen long term. But the indication is pretty much, uh, and what I think is happening is that people are well aware of the different circumstances. Like you say, we know in different social settings how to respond to people. And this is just another example of a different social setting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So one of the areas that really got me fascinated by humanoid robotics was a few years ago, I was actually employed for a summer by a company I won't name, who wanted me to investigate the feasibility of constructing a robot butler. Um, and the guy who was head of this company was quite, uh, you know, interested in this. And I think he was directly inspired by the same science museum exhibition of humanoid robots that's so brilliantly described in, in Turned On. Um, now, when I did this, I thought, well, given that Google and Boston Dynamics were likely trying and failing to achieve the same thing, <laughs> you know, we might uh, not necessarily succeed in our small company. But it's fascinating that people already have a model for how they want to interact with robot servants. There's this concept of robot butlers that everyone seems to think, you know, where is my jetpack? Where's my robot butler? Mm -hmm. There's organizations like RoboCup at home that put these existing humanoid robots through their paces, trying to get them to perform domestic tasks like stacking shelves and so on. I mean, do you think that robotics is heading in this direction? What do you think of the current generation of humanoid robots? I think it's well, there's, so there's humanoid and then there's human-like, which is the interesting one. And so humanoid may have human human features of sort of eyes or face or something like that, whereas human-like are the ones that are supposed to look really realistically human. I think we're doomed if we try to make human-like robots because we're really, really bad at it. It's very, very difficult to do, technologically speaking, and it's very expensive. But to give robots humanoid features, the faces or the voices, um, that helps. It definitely helps us bond with it um, and it's also been primed by years of sci-fi so we've had these stories and they go way back uh, stories about how people create artificial servants for example and there's always this idea that they will look like us we will create ourselves to do the labor that we all want to do so that's definitely a strong motivating factor in how things have been developed but it, you know it turns out that there there may be better ways of doing things um it's just that we're sort of stuck in that groove mm. i mean one thinks of like the darpa robotics challenge they had a few years ago where they had uh, all of these humanoid robots like atlas the big famous boston yeah. dynamics one and ultimately they found that some of these although you might think that they would perform well they were beaten by robots that just had wheels and so on because maybe the wheel yeah. is a better system yeah it, it all depends on environment and that's the thing you know we, we need to build robotics that suits the environment there is no general purpose one yet we're way way off that you know we could do maybe an all-terrain robot that has caterpillar tracks but then it's not going to work very well in a you know a domestic setting or something like that so you know it, it's and it's the same with ai we have no general ai yet we just have domain specific ai and so we've got to tailor at the moment everything to the context to the things that we wanted to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But if, if you view a sort of imagined future where, say, domestic robots of some form or another become commonplace and it's the gadget that, you know, all wealthy enough people have in their homes and it's kind of like the next middle class Christmas gadget or whatever, how do you think it would shape society if we had these domestic robots? Is, it, is this the kind of Keynesian dream of technology allowing us all to live lives of leisure or do you think something else would happen? 
I, much as I'm a techno optimist, I'm also a skeptic about domestic robotics because if we think of the domestic advances in technology that have been made, it just frees us up to do other stuff. So, you know, the washing machine was supposed to alleviate the burden of the housewife and instead we just wash our clothes more often. So I think we always find that kind of thing going on as well. Um, so, I, yeah, you know, the idea of having more leisure time would be wonderful but every time we try to do that we just fill it with something else in the same way that um you know every time we free up our memory by using technology it fills our heads with something else so i think there's always going to be that adaptation to it yes and when when you look at i mean we've talked already touched on briefly the idea of fears around automation and people being made redundant and so on and whenever you listen to the uh, the techno optimists and the robo optimists the, the argument that they often frame is well don't view it as being made redundant view it as the menial tasks being done by machines freeing you up to use more sort of creative uh, powers and and things that are still viewed as the preserve of humans. But I mean, what do you think will end up being the preserve of humans? Because we're starting to see AI and robots that are capable of doing all kinds of things that we might not have thought they would previously be able to do. There's one that writes essays now, for example. Yeah, I mean, the there are lots of different projections about where things will go with automation. And you know, given enough time, you can probably automate quite a lot of things. Creativity is the one area that's contentious. We don't know if a machine can truly be creative, but then we don't really know what creativity means. <laughs> so that's difficult too. Um, there are going to be, given the advances of technology now, there are definitely limitations. So there's going to be, there's a need for physical care that we can't meet with robotics at the moment. Um, but we can do things to enhance people's quality of life. So I think we're always going to need, at the moment, we're always going to need human carers because we just don't have the robotics for that. But we can perhaps tackle things like loneliness. Now, it's not the same as human human contact. We know that. But we could provide support systems that we didn't have before. So I think, you know, it swings and roundabouts there. Yeah, this is an area that we're, that we're about to get onto because one of the areas where people do think about robotics and even humanoid robotics is in care for the elderly particularly in nations like japan that obviously has big engineering companies toyota honda which made asimo they're looking into using robotics as a solution to take care of their aging population which you know by some demographic study half of people will be above retirement age by 2050 mm -hmm. or something if it keeps going um but it will be a problem in lots of places in the world so it's sort of saying that you don't really think it's realistic for them to do that much of the physical taking care of people, but perhaps some of the emotional taking care of people we can do, in which case that seems to be a place where human-robot interaction would be a very important thing to master, because people would not want to interact with a cold and uncaring robot, but if the robot is more uh, empathetic, warm, if they relate to it better... I mean, there are some examples of this in the field. Where do you think it's going and uh, what's sort of been achieved so far with these uh, elderly care robots? Well, Japan's robot strategy um, explicitly mentions care, but they've, they've gone from having sort of companion robots or care robots that are physically like humans and moved into the area of providing support and assistance for human carers. So moving example to the idea of an exoskeleton because a lot of carers have back problems and that would help them lift and carry. Um, and we've already seen the rollout of AI apps um, for things like mental health and therapy. So bots like Wobot that can, an AI bot that can manage your mental health by checking in with you and getting you to talk. And in fact, the first ever chat, well, one of the early chat bots, Eliza, was in the form of, had a form of therapy to it in that Eliza would repeat back your statements to kind of encourage you to speak more. And people find that really therapeutic, even though it wasn't even AI, it was just some pattern matching and scripting going on. So people are happy enough to interact with machines and have conversations with machines. And anecdotally, we see people saying, oh yeah, well, I, it helps with my loneliness. And I think there is scope to do that. And there have been trials of companion robots like Paro, the seal one, um, to mix the results. There's some skepticism over it, but there's a general feeling of, you know, of friendliness, of attachment to, to these kind of things. So there's scope to do that, but it's how we do that is, is the interesting thing. You know, what happens if you have a user group where they perhaps have dementia, so there are issues around deception there. What happens if 
you know, we, we, we ideally want human human contact. What happens? Do, would we then sort of fail people if we weren't doing that? So still lots of things to work out. Hmm. I mean, I, it's such an interesting uh, and and very subtle area to get into. I mean, I'm I'm reminded of there was a story where this was very badly handled recently, I think, where someone was told by a sort of teleconference robot. Um, did yeah. you see this? I saw this. Okay, so someone, yeah, someone received a terminal diagnosis by a telepresence robot, um, and there was lots of talk about, oh, this is this is terrible. This is what AI is going to ruin lives. There was no AI involved in this, to my uh, to my awareness. I, I think this was this was simply, a, you know, basically Skype on wheels, um, a consultation that was carried out from a remote place with a patient via a machine, and yeah, the, the, of course, there's there's problems there, definitely. So we don't want to encourage. The depersonalization of care. I think that's problematic. We want to enhance current care. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It, yeah, you're right. It's just such an interesting uh, layer because I'm sure most people would say if this is in addition to things that people are already getting, that would be marvelous. But it, mm-hmm. if it's if it's in place of, it's the same sort of argument people have about universal basic income. I guess it's like, right. If yeah. it goes in and replaces all of the stuff that people need, then that's a, a bad way of implementing it. Yeah. I mean, do you think that there are ways in which so, for example, chatbots at the moment have, they seem to have quite a short term memory. I'm thinking particularly of in Turned On, you talk about the Loebner Prize. And uh, I've talked to Steve Verzik, who is the guy who made Mitsuku, which is the sort of perpetual winner of the Loebner Prize, about his uh, his chatbot. Do you think that they are heading in a direction where they'll be able to have more meaningful, more sort of long term conversations where they retain information or what what sort of improvements would need to be made for people to really relate to a, a robot personality in that way? Yeah, there's definitely, I mean, it's come on so much in the past five years even. Um, there's definitely scope for more improvement, but there doesn't, already we see people sort of bonding with this technology. We don't even need it to be all that much more sophisticated. So we don't, we definitely don't need machine sentience, for example, for someone to feel they're being listened to by a machine. Um, that may or may not be something that one day happens as of course the AI community is split over whether that's ever going to be possible but we are interacting with AI every day specifically in the form of machine learning but we are interacting with customer services online where we can't tell the difference between a human agent or a an AI agent uh, and we don't even notice in fact, I, I still can't be sure sometimes, you know, do I say thank you or not? Because I don't know if that's a human I'm talking to. So I think we're already, in some ways, we're already there. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. We've mentioned both of these things a little bit, but like touching on that, when you can't be sure whether your interlocutor is a human or an AI. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about bots on social media whenever there's any political discussions about, you know, the normal issues that we have to deal with Brexit and Donald Trump and all this kind of thing. Usually it doesn't take that long before someone is accusing someone else of being an AI bot. I mean, do you think that people are going to get better at distinguishing between humans and AI interlocutors? Or do you think that it's actually much easier to deceive people uh, than you might think? I think it's going to get increasingly easy to to deceive people. And I think fakes are a good example of that. We risk you know, the the advances um, in technology are happening really quickly around the, the idea of being able to fake things. And although we can combat it quite quickly, it's always the risk of it being one step ahead. So I do think that deception is going to become more and more problematic. And it's really difficult to counter. Probably one of the best ways of countering it is to train people educate people to be skeptical of what they see and to question their sources which you know the the media have known for a long time and historians have been teaching us over the years so perhaps it's something that we need more awareness around uh my prudishness has allowed me to avoid it so far but it's time to talk about sex robots so let's cut through some of the headlines and hype and talk about where the state of play for sex robots is both in the academic sphere and in the commercial sphere So for several years, you've been involved in the hosting of the uh, Love and Sex with Robots conference via Goldsmiths University of London. So take us there. What are those conferences like? So I hosted, um, co-hosted the 2016 Love and Sex with Robots conference. And it was it was really interesting. So it it had basically been um, 
it had basically been stopped in Malaysia. There was a lot of controversy over it there because Malaysia is culturally conservative and um, it didn't have a home. So I said to Goldsmiths, would it be okay to host it here? Because I was working in the area at the time. And they said, yeah, that's fine. That's okay. Um, so Goldsmiths is very open about these kind of things. Um, so yeah, we brought it to, the, to London and immediately there was huge media interest so even from sending out the the press release uh saying you know this is um this is happening they, they think the, the papers spun it into things like sex festival at respected british university <laughs> you know, i had to had to break it to them that unfortunately it wasn't quite like that um and we got so many requests from the press, you know, can we attend? And we ended up with 50, around 50 academic delegates and around 40 journalists coming along to the conference. It's a pretty good uh, ratio. It was, yeah, unheard <laughs> of for academia, I think, generally. Um, but it proved to be really interesting because we were able to talk to people who work in the media about how the media was dealing with this kind of stuff. And yes, there were some really egregious headlines that came out of it, but there were also some really well-balanced stories that got reported as well. So that was really heartening to see. And what kind of thing were the academics that were there? What were they presenting? Was it studies that they'd done that were kind of conceptual studies, uh, asking people about how they feel about X, Y, or Z? Were there sort of specific examples of robots that were being uh, used as case studies? What kind of thing do they present? Yeah, so it dealt with the led. Uh, excuse me, it dealt with the legal, um, technical, social issues around uh, love and sex with robots. So there were people who had run surveys about whether or not men would be inclined to have sex with these robots. They didn't ask women for that particular study because the current robots that are being developed tend to be developed for men. Um, there were ones looking at the ethical implications. There were, oh, there was just so many different things. Um, ones looking at design, um, looking at links to other things like porn. Yeah, it was just really diverse stuff. Um, and of course, you know, pros and cons. Should we be worried? Should we not? What's the evidence? So yeah, really discussing it about where it was going to go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, I mean, bringing up one of these themes, what about legislation that is being mooted to regulate their sale and also the design of these robots? Uh, and, and is this where you had to discuss it in front of the House of Lords, for example, as a sort of expert witness? Um, well, I took part in the all-party parliamentary group on AI, and it wasn't that we were, I was called in to talk about them. It was just something that came up when <laughs> I was a matter doing of my urgency. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, it was just it became part of the evidence giving. There, there are people who are very, very opposed to the development of sex robots um, for a number of different reasons. Some of which I, I agree with. Others I don't. Um, but there is worry that there could be a negative social effect that. The development would mean that um, there was perhaps um, more isolation or increased sexual violence or um, issues around paedophilia. Lots of things to be concerned about, I think. Um, so I really wanted to go and find out what the truth was behind these worries and behind the headlines that were generated. Because actually, what I found was that there's really not any sex robots being manufactured. There's sort of one or two in production, um, one or two types in production, but they're not really out there and they're not being sold in any kind of wide scale and it's an incredibly niche thing still. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is just a sort of by the by, but what would you say is the lower threshold to actually class something as a sex mm -hmm. robot? Because presumably it would have to have a certain level of autonomy beyond an ordinary sex toy, for example, for it to be classed as a sex robot. I mean, is is there a working definition that everyone uses, or is it still no. a matter for some debate? <laughs> ah, okay, it's good. A matter of debate. I spent I spent a good chapter of my book trying to work out what a robot was, and I've worked in this area for ages. Um, so yeah, it's really difficult. So you could say that a robot is something that automates certain tasks, that can act autonomously, um, that is capable of being programmed, lots of different things, and then that separates itself from the AI. Although robots can have AI in them. Um, so when we talk about sex robots, today, what it is, is essentially a sex doll with some level of mechanization in it and perhaps some AI. But these are not robots. They can't move I mean, to the extent that they can't move on their own. They can't really be controlled other than um, 
put in a little bit of programming into the, the AI and the responses. And they're not performing a particular task. They're really just, well, lying there. Um, so they're kind of stationary. They can't even stand up on their own. So calling it a robot's really pushing it. It's kind of a shorthand, really. And I differentiate, it, I differentiate it from sex toy in that sex toys tend to be more discrete objects. They tend to be you know, um, smaller contained objects that may not move on their own other than vibrating, um, but, you know, are can be controlled and programmed. Um, so I think there's that difference, but it's really hard to pick. I put them all under the umbrella of sex tech, sex technology. Because a sex robot could be described as sex technology, a smart sex toy could be described as sex technology. Uh, so it does all fall under that umbrella. Yeah, I think that probably seems to make more sense until, until, as you say, there are more case studies to look at for what a sex robot would actually be. So when you said in 2016 there were only a couple of actual examples that had been developed, has that changed any? Is there anything no. new that's launching? Or, or is it still no. the case that there's a very small number and it's mostly conceptual? Mostly conceptual, very small number. There are li literally a handful of workshops in, around the world making making these things. Um, so the sex robot, unlike a sex toy, the sex robot has its lineage from the sex doll. So the companies that are developing them are companies that have been making sex dolls and are just adding increased uh, responsiveness to the dolls. So one of the most open examples are our best creations who set up a subsidiary company called Realbotics. And they've made a sex doll with an animatronic head and an AI personality that can also be a standalone app on a phone or a tablet. So that's sort of the most sophisticated version that's out there and they are at the stage now where they're going to develop them commercially. Um, there have been a couple of sort of garage builders, people who are you know on their own making these. Um, so Sergio Santos, who made the Samantha robot, who was interested in the AI rather than the doll form. So, you know, he got a sex doll, didn't make it himself, got one, put sensors in it, but was really interested in building a responsive and reciprocal AI personality for the doll. And then there are some factories in China who are making sex dolls that have um, sound, you know, they're capable of sound, which tends to be mostly from what I see, moaning and groaning noises. Um, um, but again, perhaps might have some vibration in them, but can't move. None of these can move on their own. None of them can stand on their own. And that's still the case today. So it's interesting because it seems like the first uh, one you were talking about is maybe starting to integrate the, a chatbot. Is that right? The one that has a standalone? That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Abyss Creations Robotics Harmony. She's called Harmony. And again, I'm using she because it's just much easier to gender mm -hmm. these things. Um, they're also developing a male model uh, called Henry. Okay. As well, but Harmony is the first and has reached a decent prototype stage, and their AI is is really quite good. They're quite good conversational AI. Um, it's not bad at all, and their animatronics are quite subtle and nice. Um, I was impressed by that. I went to see the development, thinking that I was going to be, I don't know, in some way I was quite judgmental about it. I thought you know it's going to be a very reductive stereotype of a woman. It's going to be something that's problematic to me. Mm -hmm. And actually, I found that I was impressed by the craft that went into it and to the skill that went into them. So if you're looking at these as a piece of technology, they're not bad. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. That's interesting to know because I think there's always a tendency to maybe be afraid that people would, as you say, just take an ordinary sex doll and then maybe add. I don't know, a few moving components or a few sounds mm -hmm. and then refer to it as a robot, even though most people wouldn't necessarily think that it is a robot. Yeah, I think that has been the case for you know, sort of the more mass produced, cheaper end of, of what's expected. But again, again, this is something that despite all the hype, they're not really out there. You know, there, you know there's, there's rumors of sex robot brothels. And what they mean is a sex doll that can, can vibrate a little and can moan a bit and can speak a few words. So yeah, nothing, no, no armies of sex robots taking over the world. That's not happening. So in some ways, a little bit like AI itself, in the sense that there's a lot of misconceptions maybe mm -hmm. about how sophisticated it is and how much it can achieve. Um, yeah, yeah. So when it comes to sex robots in society, do you think if if you know they continue to be developed and get better and better and gradually start to have, I guess, say. Uh, an appeal that moves beyond niche. Um, do you think we'll see the same prudish refrain surrounding sex toys that you described in, in Turned On, or has society, at least in some countries, become liberated enough that as soon as they hit a certain level of quality, they'll become widespread? And do you think that 
they'll be sought out by the same audience for sex toys today, or will there be entirely new buyers who are looking for things like companionship as well? I'm sceptical that this will, in the current form, they will be um, meet a large market. I don't think that's the case. Um, again, because of things we talked about earlier around the difficulty in making a human-like robot, I think it's very limiting to stick in that form. Um, and sex toys still aren't widely accepted. People are still reluctant. They're much more open about owning sex toys and using sex toys. But there's still a reluctance to talk very openly about it, despite... Um, it being much more widespread and there's, there's, you know, it's a massive market. So the, the sex technology industry is expected to be about $30 billion by 2020. Um, so, you know, we know that there are a lot of sex toys being developed and being bought and sold, but it's still a taboo and there's much more of a taboo around the idea of the sex robot. People are incredibly judgmental about it. Yes, I suppose it would be the case that if you knew someone who owned one, you might start to question why they bought it, especially for the prices that they would sell for. Um, right, and that's another thing is the price, because you're talking, I think, um, the Robotics One Harmony retails for upwards of $12,000. So these are definitely special purchases. So and I've heard people say, oh, well, you know, if the porn industry gets involved, they've got the money and they can make these. But the, the porn industry, from what I can gather, is not interested in doing that. And why would they be? They're making huge amounts of money on the back of video. They're not going to branch into robotics. What would you say is the future for sex robots? Do you think that they will continue to occupy this this fringe place? Or do you think that it, there is a, a a place for them in society? I think that... In the near future, they're going to be niche. And we may see a change in form. I, I'm advocating for a change in form. I think we can move away from the idea of the humanoid, human-like sex robot and into looking at more immersive experiences and wearables and things like that that extend sex toys into a, a greater form and include companionship. And we may see with the increase in conversational AI, we may see that that is something that provides companionship. Because a lot of people who are buying sex dolls today are buying them for companionship. They want to be able to have a something that will listen, whether that's a doll that they project that onto, or perhaps further down the line, a conversational AI. It's the element of companionship and sex is almost secondary to that. So I think there's definitely scope to move into new forms. Um, for some people, it is the human form that they want. Um, but I think if you look at the change in sex toy design, so sex toys have moved away from being genital replicas into being very beautiful and well-designed objects, we may see that with sex robots as well. I'm hopeful. Mm -hmm. And that sort of comes down to the idea that people are building new categories of uh, of almost ways in which to interact with technology where they have, you know, human, animal, child, but also technology that yeah. is somewhere in between the rest of them. Um, yeah. I think it's also interesting that the sex robot area, the sex robot field today, is incredibly restricted to generally straight white men. That's kind of a reflection of Silicon Valley. And there's no diversity in this, They're not really anything that we're hearing outside of that you know even with the token oh here's a male sex doll sort of thing which the intentions are good but I'm not sure that that's got going to have quite the same audience and uh, women are incredibly reluctant to talk about owning sex dolls as well um, so we don't really know how many people out there how many women out there actually own sex dolls so I think that the scope is much better in terms of marketing as well and in terms of diversity if we extend sex toys into the wearable and immersive experiences rather than focusing on this idea of a artificial human lover. See, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, so we've talked about earlier some of the uh, concerns that people have with these being manufactured and marketed and concerns about increases of sexual violence and, uh, I guess the same kind of concerns that people have with uh, certain kinds of pornography as well. I mean, mm -hmm. from, from a feminist perspective, is there such a thing as a feminist sex doll? Can, <laughs> can they be, uh, I, I don't know, because of course the issue of objectification becomes quite a problem when you're talking about an actual physical object that one can purchase and own. 
Yeah, well, there are there are many different flavors of feminism, really, and I just yeah, and I would de- I describe myself as as a sex positive feminist, definitely a pro sex feminist, in that I think that we should be free to explore sexuality um, without judgment. But I again I I see a problem with the reductive stereotyping of women in the in the form that the sex robots currently take, which is why if we move into more abstract areas, we move to voice as being a, a predominant humanizing factor, we may move away from that. Um, so you get some people. There are there are feminists who are incredibly anti-porn, for example. I'm I'm not, so I I can you know I'm I'm anti-exploitation, and most most ethically minded people will be. Um, so I know that there are problems in the porn industry for sure, but you know I'm not intrinsically against porn. So I think that we we can and and sex toys I think are an incredibly good thing that are bring pleasure to many people um, that allow sex to become something accessible to everyone. Um, and so I think there's much more scope in going down the route of um, yeah, getting away again, getting away from this, this stereotyping of women and the sex robots. And do you think, as you sort of alluded to before, what's needed is a change of mind and a change of mentality from Silicon Valley? I mean, just in general, it seems that the last two or three years has seen a really big backlash towards big technology companies. And of course, that backlash was always there amongst some people who were looking at them. But it's it's getting into the mainstream now that these companies are viewed as the villains rather than the the heroes of our sort of current society. Do you think that it, it that we need a change of personnel in the people who are running these companies and the people that they're thinking about when they design their products? That would be it... lovely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's do that. I, I would love a revolution. I'm a bit more women as well. Um, yeah, but then again, I think that this, so the things with the sex robots is that there's no large corporate backing. There's no mm-hmm. major investment. There's no big company behind this. Um, but yeah, I think in general, definitely tech, we know how biased tech is. It, it's biased in terms of the people who run the companies, in terms of the people who make the tech, and in terms of the tech itself and who it's aimed at where the default is always the male user so i think that there's definitely scope to improve that and the reliance on machine learning algorithms itself can right. perpetuate so the so biases bias. that are in our society i mean absolutely. absolutely just recently we've been thinking about youtube's algorithm radicalizing people towards the far right yeah. and other ways in which it's been exploited so i mean th- there must be lots of talk in the ai computer science community about how we can eliminate this problem of Mm -hmm. algorithmic bias. Right, there's loads of talk. I mean, there's absolutely loads of talk. It is the sort of key thing in the ethics field at the moment, in the AI ethics field. The problem is we don't have a solution for it. We all know that it needs to be done, but we're not quite sure how we go about doing it. And the big companies are aware of that as well. I mean, Google are aware that their image search is problematic, for example. Um, It's trying to solve that that is the problem. How do we do that? And I think... There are possible approaches and transparency around data sets is one of them. And if we can show how we got our data sets, that's one step. If we can show some of the decision making processes, that's another. But that's an incredibly difficult thing to do if you've got layers and layers of neural networks working. So that's you know, it's we can say, look, we give the this information to the machine. This is what came out the other end of the machine learning process. Um, but the whole bit in the middle is a black box, and that's the bit that it's really hard to describe. So, I think again, transparency and teaching people to be critical of sources is going to be vital. Mm. And it's almost as as best we can do because, as you say, there's that central black box bit which companies are going to be reluctant to open up to us, and in some cases. We almost we simply don't have the resources to independent investigators, for example, couldn't run the same algorithms in the same way that a Google right. or a Facebook does because well, the scale yeah. is sort of one off. Yeah, and it's not just that. So it's not just the you know, um, transparency around the companies because you know we we can we're pu- we push to set up people to set up ethics boards and some of them do, but you know, that's not necessarily a solution. But it's the actual fact the fact that we don't know what the software does. The very nature of machine learning is that if you're going into deep learning, you don't know what's happening there. You don't know what's happening to the data until it comes out the other end. And it's just impossible. There's so many things happening there that it's impossible to trace. Um, So even if we wanted to make that transparent, we're not able to. Okay. It's just, it does seem like a real crisis point for the field. And I hope that 
we can leverage lots of the advantages that machine learning obviously has yeah. without without the the kind of terrible impacts on society that it's starting to have. Absolutely. Going back to this idea of conversational AI and chatbots that you can talk to, and uh, there there have been several attempts at this. So there was Microsoft's Tay dot AI, which <laughs> <I think laughs> yes. used neural networks. Uh, yeah, do you want to tell the story of that? Yeah, so Tay was a chatbot that was released by Microsoft onto Twitter to, to learn from Twitter interactions. And within 24 hours, Twitter users had managed to turn Tay into a racist, fascist, sexist bot. Um, and so this is the dangers of sort of sending things out there. Um, and sure, some of that was completely intentional as well, um, people, with people trying to break the system. But yeah, it's, it's sort of like, this is what happens if you if you don't prepare, if you don't safeguard, if you don't pay attention to what's happening with your AI and it's where it's getting its data from. And you have to imagine if they'd rolled that out in any sort of other context. I mean, imagine if that was the AI that was used to talk to people in nursing homes or something. It would just be right. a PR <laughs> disaster, worse yeah. than it even was. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so there's attempts like that where people are trying to uh, learn how to speak from machine learning approaches with big data sets. And there's attempts like Steve Verzik's attempt where it ultimately is just a very, very large set of scripts uh, that are put into the AI. I mean, do you think that we're going to be able to get to conversational AI that doesn't need scripting at some point? Do you think that the machine learning approach has legs or are we going to be relying on humans writing the script for a long time to come? Um, in the near future, humans, but further on, yeah, I, I, I think there is scope to do it. Okay, it might not, you know, again, not, not at a sentient level, but in a much more seamless way, I think we're going to get there. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I hate making predictions because they'll come back and bite me. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't I, worry, we, <laughs> we won't come back in five, ten okay. years and say you were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that you know, it, it will it will reach a stage where, like I say already, you know, in, in certain contexts we can't tell already. So I think that that may broaden out. I don't necessarily know that we're going to get an artificial general intelligence. I'm skeptical about that, but I think we will be able to have much more seamless interaction with specific, domain specific chatbots. And ultimately, as you say, it doesn't have to be a general intelligence to start impacting society and changing exactly. society and meaning things to people. What would you yeah. say is the most meaningful interaction that you've had with a robot? Ooh. Oh, I don't know. That's a really difficult question. <laughs> well, you know, I had a well, I did have a meaningful interaction with um, Harmony, the sex robot, um, in terms of I was talking to a robot um, in, and it was it was an interesting thing in a, in a field where this was the first one. So to me, that was quite an impressive thing. The, the, I got to see the sort of world's first commercially available sex robot. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've, I, as I talk to robots, they'll sound a bit odd, but you know, the interactions with robots like Pepper, for example, mm -hmm. the soft bank robotics, soft bank, robots. And, um, Pepper is an interesting one. Um, there's something appealing, you know, even though you know that Pepper is watching you, recording all your information there's something quite cool i think my favorite was probably paro the little robot seal pup um paro is just immensely cute and interactions with paro it, it is like having like a, a soft toy come to life or or an animal or a pet um and i find that quite emotional to be able to just kind of make paro chirp at me <laughs> that was quite sweet well, it's interesting because it just sort of shows how important the design is. I mean, Pepper is designed not necessarily to look like a child, but almost to behave like a child with kind right. of naive curiosity. And then the robot dog. I mean, I what was it called? Ibo, the Sony Ibo, robot yeah. dog. It's very popular several years ago. Yeah, so the expectation thing is really important because if we have a realistically human robot, we have expectations of something to behave in a human-like manner. Whereas if we have a pet robot, we don't expect that much. Our expectations are much, much lower. So with Pepper, it has a childlike voice, so we can't quite tell if you can't quite gender it. It's childlike size. It's only about four foot tall. Um, it has these big eyes that are sort of appeal to the idea of cuteness. Um, and again, with Paro, the seal, it's just a, it's a gorgeous little fluffy, cuddly seal pup. So of course, you know, we think it's really pretty and cute and we all go, aw. So definitely our expectations depend on the form that we're presented with, for sure. And if you were designing a robot yourself, you'd probably think, OK, well, I need to make sure that people's expectations of this are going to be commensurate with its ability. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I do. I, um, I've tried a few times running exercises where I get people to design their ideal sex robot. We've played games around that. It's been quite interesting to see. What kind of things do people design? 
Oh, anything from uh, robots with screens for faces so they can put, you know, the face of someone they fancy on them or you know, <laughs> stream porn while they're on it. Oh, or, you know, we've got tentacles, very popular. Yeah. <laughs> um, feathers for hands, lots of really cool stuff. Just people really pushing the boundaries, which is why I ended up running hackathons around designing new forms of sex technology because I was really intrigued as to people's ideas when they're breaking, breaking the mould of what we expect. I mean, with something like 3D printing, one could imagine that you could eventually have a, a very customizable design for this sort of thing. Yeah, totally. Uh, and that's that's the interesting part. The interesting part, I think, about AI in general and about robotics in general is the idea of uh, modularity and customization. So modularity in terms of the robotics parts and customization and personalization in, form, in terms of the AI. Um, and that's a really cool thing. We could make technology that suits us and suits our lifestyle and suits what we wanted to do. And someday maybe the human form will just be considered vanilla. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so ultimately it feels like a lot of the questions that are raised and turned on could be applied in other ways to the ways that humans interact with technologies. It's what we've been talking about the whole time, really. Uh, virtual reality, AI. And you throw up this fascinating question, I think, which is when it comes down to it, when the technology gets good enough, will humans prefer flawed, difficult, but real interaction with real humans and the real world? Or will they ultimately be seduced, so to speak, by artificial technological constructs where things can be perfect and tailored exactly to your liking. I mean, do you think this is a choice that we face? Do you view it as a risk or an enhancement to the human I, condition? I think that overall, we're going to stick with humans. <laughs> we are <laughs> fundamentally social creatures who seek out each other. And I don't think that's going to change. But I think we can use the technology to enhance our love, sex, intimacy aspects of our lives. And that's a good thing. So we can bring people closer together through technology. And for people who may have no one, it may be that that technology is a replacement and a welcome replacement. So I think the end goal is still get humans together. I know it's how we got here. It's how we keep the human species going. Um, so I am optimistic about that. I think there's a lot to be said for the human connection. But I think there's also a lot to be said for technology bringing us closer. Dr. Kate Devlin, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Physical Attraction, and many thanks to our guest, Dr. Kate Devlin. You can find her book, Turned On, Science, Sex and Robots, wherever good books are sold, but I also highly recommend the audiobook. If, like me, you're getting those monthly audible credits, it's wonderfully narrated by the author. You can also find out more about her work at www.drkatedevlin.com, and if you Google around, there are some TED Talks and things of that variety to keep you entertained. And now for our housekeeping. A reminder that I'm still planning this 100th episode competition, but the due date is being continually extended until I get more entries. Send your answers to the question, what is physics, in text or audio format via the contact form on our website or via physicspod at outlook.com, physicspod at outlook.com, and you'll be in with a chance to win books from some of our previous interview guests and a place on the show. The Nuclear Fusion series will be resuming shortly, and I can't wait to share it all with you, but at the same time, I'm not averse to having a few off-topic breaks now and then as a palate cleanser. But if you have any comments, questions, or concerns about the show, show topics that you'd like to hear next, all that kind of thing, you can contact me via the contact form at www.physicspodcast.com. And you can find me on Twitter at PhysicsPod, or follow the Facebook page at Physical Attraction. If you want to support the show, we have a Patreon account at www.patreon.com slash physicalattraction. And I've actually just put up some B-sides there, shows that I recorded but didn't release for one reason or another, that subscribers can now enjoy listening to, alongside all the bonus episodes on alien attacks, free energy scams, and failed end-of-the-world predictions. Of course, if you don't want to donate, that's fine. The best thing you can do to support us is always, always, always to tell as many people about the show as you possibly can. Until next time then, take care.